I heard all of the parents giggling there towards the end. I wonder why. Hey, and welcome to Compass. My name is Nathan Lewis. Our mission here is navigating people to God. I am incredibly excited that you are here this morning as we continue on in week three of this series, Me in My Big Mouth. But look, before we go any further, I wanna do something a little different this morning. I wanna play a game with you, okay? And so here's the game. Have you ever heard of or played this game called Never Have I Ever, show of hands? And it's okay to admit it, I'm not gonna ask for examples of questions or the context in which you played the game. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, okay? But so most of us in here have played the game or have heard of the game, and in case you haven't or in case it's been a while since you have played the game, let me just do a real quick rundown of the rules, it's pretty simple. I will say a statement that starts off with never have I ever, and then if you have done that thing that I say, raise your hand in the air, admit to it. If you haven't done that thing, just sit there and make fun of everyone else around you, okay? For those of you that are on Facebook Live, you can chime in with a Y for yes or an N for no. It's pretty simple there too. Okay, so just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I am going to do like a little tester, a test run here. Okay, you ready for this? Never have I ever picked my nose in public. I didn't ask whether or not you were caught or whether or not you thought you got away with it. I'm talking like if you were in public with other people around and you just tried to be a little sneaky and get in there, put your hand up. Never have I ever picked my nose in public. Okay, you guys are disgusting. <laughs> no, okay, so here's the deal. Like, we're gonna play this game, but before, before we dive into the actual game, I just wanna put a disclaimer out there, okay? You are in church. You cannot lie. If you lie in church, you go straight to hell. You do not pass go, you do not collect $200, okay? So that now that everybody's salvation is at stake, <laughs> let's play the game. All right, so here we go. First one, never have I ever said you too when a waiter or a waitress tells me to enjoy my meal. <laughs> I almost did it on Friday. We went to the Crayola place and she said, have a good time. And I said, you, nope, I'm not doing it. <laughs> All right, next one. Never have I ever asked when the baby was due when there was no baby. Yep. There's no recovering from that. You just smile and turn away and walk somewhere else. Never have I ever, here's the next one, never have I ever said, what a cute little boy about someone's daughter. Yep. Parents, literally a word of advice. Bows. They work wonders. All right. Next one, never have I ever hesitated when my spouse asked, does this make me look fat? <laughs> Raise it up there, get it up, come on. Never, ever hesitate. You say no before that sentence is over. Okay, couple more. Never have I ever called a significant other by an ex's name. Yep, okay. Nicknames are key. <laughs> Just gonna throw that out there too. All right, last one. Never have I ever put my foot in my mouth. All of you that are not raising your hands, liars. <laughs> Every single one of you, because we've all done that, right? We have all, at some point in time, put our foot in our mouths, hence the importance of this lesson that we've been harping on over the last couple of weeks, to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Because words are hard, words are powerful. And so over the last couple of weeks, we've been hanging out in this book of the Bible called James that was written by the little brother of Jesus. And if you've not seen the first two weeks, I highly encourage you to go and watch Kevin that first week and Garrison last week because they are game-changing, life-altering lessons that we're learning here. But last week, Garrison talked to us about the power of words, and hopefully we've begun to see that over the last couple of weeks. 
And what he said is that we needed to be careful. We needed to put a leash on our tongue, a guard on our mouths, because words are powerful. Be quick to listen and slow to speak, because if we're not, our words can be one of two things. It can either burn everything around us to the ground like a California wildfire, or if we can put that leash on it, if we can guard our mouths, then our words can be a campfire for people to surround and find comfort and rest and energy for the journey ahead. But like I said, words are powerful. It's great that Garrison told us that. It's really good that we're reading this in James and everything like that. But if I was really honest with you, like knowing what to do doesn't always work out for me. I mean, this, Garrison just told us these three words last week, remember, surrender, and confess with our words. And it, like, it was literally a week ago. Guys, I didn't even last a week. I'm still terrible at this thing. And I'm going to go ahead and shove all of my inadequacies off on you this morning because I think that we experience the same thing. No matter how hard we try, even when we tend to put this stuff in there, we're still not the best at it, and our words tend to get a little hot and to singe the people around us. And so the question I've been asking myself is, there is, is there a way that we can do a better job? Is there like a preemptive strike that we can make with our words before they even bubble up and out of us? The good news is I believe that there is a preemptive strike. But in order to find it, I think we've got to look at some words from this dude named Paul that were written a long, long, long time ago. Now, Paul was this guy, he wasn't always known as Paul. Actually, when we were first introduced to him in the Bible, his name is Saul. And when he was known as Saul, he hated Christians, like he hated them. So much so that he would travel around the known world and he would have a heavy hand in either putting them in prison or having them put to death. And he's really, really good at it, like crazy good at it. It's kind of scary. And so he's traveling around the known world, but then there's this one instance that we read about whenever Paul is on the way to this place called Damascus. And on the road to Damascus, he literally has this face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus, and he's literally blinded by the light. Now, scholars speculate whether or not he was revved up like a deuce. That's neither here nor there. Thank you for those of you that laughed. But after this encounter, Paul still travels the known world, except instead of persecuting Christians, he begins to empower them. And he begins setting up churches all across the world. And one of the main ways that he began to empower these Christians is that he started to write letters to these churches that he helped start. And one letter was to a church in this city called Ephesus. And we know this letter to the church in Ephesus as the book of Ephesians today in the New Testament. And that's actually where we're gonna hang out today. Ephesians chapter four. But before we dive in any further, I wanna put another disclaimer out there, okay? For those of you in here that are new to this whole church thing, maybe you don't really know about this whole Jesus God deal. Maybe you're kind of just dipping the toe. Maybe there's some of you in here that literally just showed up today to look at the water. You're not even close to dipping your toe in it. Let me just say to you this morning, Paul is not speaking to you here. Paul is writing to Christians, to followers of Jesus. And so this morning, you get a pass, you're welcome. But here's the thing, I think still that there is a lesson for all of us in here, regardless of our religious beliefs, that if we were to lean in, to perk up, and to listen a little bit, I think that there's something that would change every single one of us in here. And I'm not gonna tell you why, you're gonna have to pay attention and follow along. For those of you that are followers of Christ in here, that you call Jesus your Lord and Savior, you better buckle up because Paul is about to drop the hammer on how it is that we are to conduct ourselves as followers of Christ, especially when it comes to our mouth and our words. So with all of that, Ephesians chapter four, beginning in verse 17, Paul writes this. He says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. 
Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. And so Paul says, look, those of you that believe in Jesus, you cannot live like you used to. Back then, you used to live for you and you alone. You were looking out for number one, period, the end. And to be really honest with you, Ephesians, people that call themselves Jesus followers in the city of Ephesus, if you were to look around you, your friends, your family that does not believe in Jesus, that's how they tend to act as well. But you cannot do that anymore. You have to live differently. And he continues on in verse 20. He says, but that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. So Paul says, throw off the old self, your old sinful nature. And the thing to take note here is that this is not delicate language. Paul's not saying like, hey, you used to live that way, and so what I need you to do is I need you to take that off, I need you to fold it up, put it in your drawer, and just slide it in there nice and neat, okay? Like, he's not saying that. This is actually like super, almost kind of violent language where Paul's saying like, rip it off, get it off of you without the intent of putting it back on. And I really and truthfully believe that this is what Paul is calling us to do. <laughs> Get rid of it, throw it off, Hulk Hogan that thing. But why? Why do we need to do that? And I think a lot of us would tend to maybe lean into like the churchy answer of like, well, because the Bible says so. Like, okay, but why beyond that for me, right? Look or listen back, um, listen again to, to what Paul says there. He says, throw off your old sinful nature in your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception, so why should we throw off that old sinful nature? Because it's corrupted. It doesn't work like it's supposed to. A couple of weeks ago, I had to take my phone to the Apple store because the screen was freaking out on me. It had this thing going on called ghost screen. Have you guys heard of this? Any of you? No? Okay, that's fine. We'll just move on with the analogy. But it had this thing going on with the ghost screen. So like what would happen is that I would open my phone, I would start to like do something, open an app, call my mom, something like that. And the screen would just start doing this. Like just freaking out on me. Sometimes I would call my mom and it'd be like, hey mom, she goes, hey. And then all of a sudden I would hear me, 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 because it was just dialing numbers for some random reason. It would open apps when I wasn't touching the screen. Sometimes I would touch it on the bottom left-hand corner and it would register in the top right-hand corner. Sometimes I would touch it and it wouldn't even work at all. Super frustrating, I know, first world problems, but it was super frustrating, right? So I take it in there and they fixed it for free, thank the Lord Jesus, because Apple's expensive, but they fix it for free because there was a corruption that they knew about in some of the screens within the iPhone 10s. There was a corruption in there that was making it not work the way that it was supposed to. We know that that's the case when it comes to tech, when it comes to software, that like if there's a corruption, if there's an issue in there, things don't work like it's supposed to, and they can be pretty disastrous. I think the disconnect that we tend to have is that we forget that the same thing is true in our lives. It's why we keep thinking that more is going to be enough and sate our appetites, but after every single dish, we walk away hungry, sometimes even more hungry than when we showed up. It's why we feel incredibly devalued in that relationship that's based on nothing but sex because it's short-circuited intimacy. It's why when we hide behind a screen and the only interaction that we ever have with people is through a screen and not face-to-face -face because that short-circuited community, it's a short-circuited, corrupted aspect of the life that God has created for you and for me. Paul keeps going. 
He says, throw off the old self. Don't live that corrupted life. And then in verse 23, he says, instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Don't live like you used to. Throw off the old self because it's corrupted. It doesn't work. It's short-circuited. Instead, let the spirit rewire your life to where it begins to work like God has actually planned out for it. Change your thoughts, your attitude, your actions. And then he begins to go into some of these areas that we need to change and some of these areas that we really need to look out for, one of which being our mouths. So skip down to verse 29 with me. He says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Foul or abusive language. Sometimes this is translated as unwholesome talk, unwholesome speak, but the Greek word that's used here is sapros. Say that with me, sapros. One more time, sapros. It's literally translated rotten, putrefied, or rotten, spoiled fish. It's pretty much anything that is distasteful, and so it has this this connotation, this idea of smelly, rotten, nasty, stanky, fishy, smelly shoes. Like imagine a middle schooler's gym bag at the end of the season because you know they've only brought their gear home twice in about 10 months to wash that thing and it's gross. And you unzip the bag and this green cloud like in the cartoons comes and hits you square in the face and your initial reaction is hup, <laughs> hup, uh. That's what Paul's talking about here. Paul says we can't let our words be nasty and filthy and gross like that. Because when we do, we look a lot like this dude. This is a piece of art in Kansas City of a dude that literally has a shoe stuffed in his mouth. This is what Paul's saying we look like when we don't watch our mouths. When we don't guard what comes out of them as we learned last week in James. <clears throat> so Paul says, no unwholesome, fishy, rotten, foul, abusive language from your mouths, Jesus followers. Don't do it. But he doesn't stop there. And this is a part of the reason that I love Paul so much because Paul doesn't just sit there and say, hey, don't do this. And then just walks away to another thing that we shouldn't do. Paul knows that the best way to not do something a lot of times is to replace it with something else. And so he sits here and he says, look, don't talk like that. But then he follows it up with something to replace. And he says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Don't have shoe fish mouth, Paul says. Or as James would put it, don't burn everything around you to ash. Instead, let your words be good and helpful and encouraging. But don't misunderstand Paul here. Paul's not saying simply to be nice. He's not saying, okay, guys, listen, we tend to be pretty harsh with our words. And so what we need to do is we just need to be nice to everybody, okay? Okay. That's not what Paul's saying here. He's not doing that. Because Paul realizes that that, like, that won't work. We can't raise our kids like that, right? We can't go, okay, Timmy, um, let's not hit baby brother in the face with our plastic bat anymore, okay? Okay. Like, that doesn't work. Or if you're having a performance review at work with someone who's not performing, you don't walk into that thing, start talking to him and say, okay, um, if you could, uh, could you please like maybe show up to work sometimes? Like that doesn't work, right? Paul's not simply saying to be nice. Are we nice to people? Of course. But Paul is calling us to be helpful and encouraging. And to do so means that we have to extend both grace and truth. And I think that the issue for us a lot of times because we're human is that we tend to gravitate towards one side or the other. 
And so for those of us in here that gravitate towards the grace side, like we tend to not confront anything, right? We just sweep everything under the rug and everything's good. Like your kid is a psychopath in public. Like they are going nuts. They're crawling all over everything. They're jumping and swinging off of chandeliers. Like they're just, they're absolutely insane. And then all of those people in the restaurant that are looking at you, giving you that like, hey, your kid's a psycho stare. Like (laughs) you're just sitting there and you're like, (laughs) well, kids are kids. (laughs) No, no, they are not. Put a leash on your mouth and your kid. Just gonna toss that out there for you. But seriously though, for those of us in here that lean a little bit too much towards the grace side, what that means for us in order to be encouraging, in order for us to be truly helpful, we're gonna have to begin to say those things that are hard, that we tend to avoid. We shower people with grace, yes, but there has to be some truth. There has to be boundaries for people in order for them to grow and to grow well. Now there are some others in here that tend to lean a little bit to the other side. It's the, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, regardless of what the circumstances and the situation is. And if you can't stand the heat, you better get out the kitchen, right? We have those people that are like, man, I'm just going to say truth, 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 and just beat everybody over the head with the truth. And let me just say this. I have a five month old. He's awesome. He's the sweetest kid. I love him to death. He's my second kid. But he's five months old. And I mean, look at this kid. He's super cute, right? (laughs) Look at that kid. He's such a cutie, but not at three in the morning. (laughs) Nope. And not at 3.30. And not at four. And not at 4.30. And he's not super cute to me when he cries for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And guys, when this tends to happen, all I can do with myself is just pray for Jesus to come back. That's all I'm asking for. Dear God, please send your son back so I don't have to go through this anymore. And it reminded me of the same like, life stage with my first one. Because like it was, it was my first one, I had no idea what I was doing. And so he would just cry for hours. And his mom was at work, I was home alone, I was freaking out. And so I would just look at him and be like, I, I don't know what to do. I, I, I've burped you, I've fed you, I've changed you. Are you tired? Then go to sleep, please. God, go to sleep. Like I, it would get so frustrating that I would look at him and I would just say, use your words. <laughs> oh, And I think if we really think about it, that's what those people that tend to lean into the truth aspect of it a little too heavy tend to be like. They tend to be a lot like crying babies that just say, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. You're not right, I'm right. Something's wrong, you're not right, I'm right. If that's harsh because you're a truth person, it's just the truth. (laughs) See what I did there? But look, no, for those of us that maybe lean a little too heavy on the truth side, like what we have to remember and begin to put into place is that we're not telling, I'm not telling you to lie, right? Except for for if your spouse asks you if it makes them look fat. Then you lie if you need to, okay? (laughs) Paul's not telling you to lie. He's not telling you to be untrue. But what we have to remember is that we don't always have to be true in every single circumstance and scenario, especially social media, okay? We maybe need to realize that in order for us to be encouraging and helpful, maybe that means we actually don't have to say anything in that instance and scenario. Because Paul's point is not to be nice, it's simply to be helpful. The NIV translation says to say only what is helpful for building others up. And in that little statement, Paul uses construction language. And he tells us that our words can essentially be building materials or they can be wrecking balls. And so every single time we walk away from the construction site, the conversation, the question we have to ask ourselves is, is that person better for having talked to me? Have you been Bob the Builder or Miley Cyrus? And you knew I was going to go there. If I was really honest with you this morning, 
looking back on a lot of the conversations that I've had in my life and even some of the conversations that I had this last week, I don't know if I always build up. Like I told you at the beginning of this thing, like I still struggle with this and it's, it's incredible the way that God works on you whenever you're preparing for a message like this. It's incredible, but it's also terrible. But anyway, because I, I find myself striving after this, but there tends to be things that continue to get in the way for me. And like I said, I'm gonna throw my inadequacies off on you this morning and I'm gonna say that you experience the same thing. There's still things that get in the way even when I try to rein in my words. And I think Paul gets that. I think that's why he goes into this next part. And this is that preemptive strike that we were talking about at the beginning of this deal. In verse 30, he says, and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. He's saying God is in the construction business. Don't undo what it is that God is trying to do. Build up, don't demolish. And then he goes into some of those things that get in the way. He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Now, let me read that first part one more time. Get rid of all bitterness. I think a lot of times when we read that, our tendency is is to understand Paul as saying, okay, stop being bitter. And from here on out, Don't be bitter anymore. But that's not what he's saying. The word that Paul uses for get rid of is literally translated as get rid of. Get rid of it. It means to pick it up, put it in the trash bag, and take it to the street and don't deal with it anymore. Because, like, look, like we don't keep trash around in our house, right? Like that's that's kind of ridiculous. Like if we burn a meal or something like that, that it's like sometimes your spouse tries to be really nice and do something fancy and it just tastes terrible. Like you don't say, you know what? I think I need to remember that. And so I'm gonna keep the meat packaging and just sit it on the counter for a little bit. Or like when you go out to a restaurant, you don't have a terrible experience and you're like, I wanna remember that terrible experience for the rest of my life. And so I'm gonna bring a doggy bag of the really, really trashy food that I had. Like we don't, we don't do that, right? If you do, it's gross. Like we'll, I'll, we'll pray for you or something like that, man. That's disgusting. But we don't do that, right? And I think that we can all get behind that idea, but that's essentially what we do with bitterness. We hold on to that wrong, perceived or real, like a piece of trash. And like I said, the way that God works whenever you're preparing for a message or something like that is that, Like he just, he, man, I hated reading this because that's what I tend to do. That's honestly what I love to do because when I hold on to that bitterness from that perceived wrong or that real wrong from that person or that group of people, what happens is it makes me feel way better about myself because I'm the victim and they're the evil, sinful child of Satan, right? But the problem is that bitterness begins to seep into every thing. And before we know it, that piece of trash begins to rot and grow putrid. And then before we know it, our words become smelly and rotten and fishy and stanky like some fish shoes. If you don't believe me, let me ask you this. Have you ever heard someone say this to you? It's not what you said, It's how you said it. See, bitterness is the difference between, well, I'll do it, and I'll do it. Get rid of it. Pick it up, put it in a bag, take it to the street. And that's great, but how do I do it? Again, in true Paul fashion, he takes it a step further for us. And he gives us a solution to bitterness. And he says, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. (laughs) Dang it, Paul. Are you serious right now? That's a really, really high bar because I'll be really transparent with you. I am a slug and I make decisions on a regular basis that shatters the heart of God. Yet he still looks at me 
he still loves me and he still forgives me. And so that is how I'm supposed to forgive other people? Nope, I'm good. But that's how serious Paul and Jesus, for that matter, is about anger and bitterness. Just look back at Matthew 5 whenever Jesus talks about anger and forgiveness and a little bit of bitterness. Because bitterness requires forgiveness. Bitterness too often comes from words that are spoken to us, over us, about us. And so we can't expect to build anything around us with a wrecking ball like bitterness hidden inside of us. It's the very reason that we end up leaving a toxic relationship and we bring all of that baggage into the next relationship. It's why we leave a job where our boss has just treated us as less than a human being. And so we're gun shy in this next place even though that very place may be where God has called us to have the most kingdom impact. I love what Andy Stanley says about forgiveness. He says, forgiveness calls us to make a decision to give someone from the past what they don't deserve so that we can give those around us what they do deserve. Let me read that again. Forgiveness calls us to make a decision to give someone from the past what they don't deserve so we can give those around us what they do deserve. So Paul says, bag it up, get rid of it. Throw your bitterness in a trash bag and take it to the street. But before you take it all the way to the street, Paul says, why don't you go ahead and throw your anger, your rage, your harsh words and your slander in there as well. And so Paul's telling us to get rid of all of our words that demean and degrade and disrespect the people around us. They're the things that steal value from the people around us. Remember when I told you that regardless of your religious beliefs, I believe that there's a lesson for us today that we can all put into practice that would make our lives better and the world around us better. Here's that lesson. When we're able to forgive, we're able to build When we're able to forgive, we're able to build. I believe that that is a truth that regardless of your religious beliefs, you can get behind. Because forgiveness makes unity possible. See, Paul's entire purpose for writing this book that we know as Ephesians is unity. And I think in our day and age, Unity is something that we can all get behind regardless of what it is that we believe. Imagine if we started putting this into place, imagine what the relationship between races would look like. Imagine what the 2020 election next year would look like or your marriage or your relationship with your estranged children or maybe even the relationship with an ex. This lesson, among many others in the Bible, is something that I think every single one of us in here, regardless of what you believe about this Jesus guy and this whole Christianity thing, I think we can all get behind that when we are able to forgive, we're able to build. And so here's two questions to close out for you. This is what I want you to wrestle with over lunch, after your nap, over dinner, on your way to work tomorrow morning. First one is this, where do I have work to do? Where in my life do I need to start building? Maybe it's an area that you have already come through like a wrecking ball and you have knocked that thing down to its very foundation. You've burned it to the ground. Who hopes I get to work soon is the second question. Who is it in my life that hopes I get to work soon? That as I head home today, I pick up the phone and I call them and I extend forgiveness to them or I ask for forgiveness. Is it your wife? Is it your kids? Is it a coworker? Is it a parent? Do you need to go back to that restaurant that you went to last night to see if that server or that manager 
is there so that you can say, I'm sorry. I burned you to the ground. Where do I have work to do and who hopes I can get to work soon? Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you, and you can't really answer those questions. You're pushing back a little bit and you say, Nathan, you, you don't know my story. You don't know the hurt that I have been through. You don't know me. You don't know my story. And you're exactly right. I don't. But I'll tell you what I do know. I do know of a story other than the story of Jesus Christ that's in the Bible that I believe could potentially be one of the most, if not the other most powerful story outside of the crucifixion of Jesus that we're gonna learn about next week. And so if you're sitting here and you say, I don't, I don't, I don't know, you don't know my story. I do know a story. Rory's gonna walk us through that next week and I hope that you are here for next week because it will change your life. But today, remember that when we're able to forgive, we're able to build. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for what it is that you have called us to do, regardless of how hard it is. That in the midst of our pain and our hurt, that we don't have to hold on to it like a piece of trash anymore to where it ends up corrupting and making our lives stink. So God, we pray for courage today that you would help us answer those questions well. Not for us, but for those around us. May we not continue to demolish what it is that you are trying to build up. Thank you for the incredible example that you have given us in this, in Jesus. And it's in his name, amen.